Welcome to the really useful podcast, the tech podcast for technophobes. Um, my name is Christian Colley and with me this week is James Frew. Hello, James. Hey, Christian. You doing all right? I'm not bad. I'm wearing hot glasses and uh, my calendar's all to pod. But other than that, everything's <laughs> grand here. Uh, we have got a few interesting tidbits to talk to you about this week. We'll start off with a quick update on my Samsung tablet repair. Uh, we'll be looking at um, a new place to find the Apple TV app and how Google Apps can help you to reduce smartphone use. We'll also learn about the recent VPN hack and what that actually means. We've got a new feature. We're going to look at some ACE recommendations. Um, basically, your host for whatever week will choose a link each to share with you, which might it could be anything. It could be a YouTube link. It could be a Twitter account it could be a tutorial website it could be a specific article and make use of even it could be absolutely anything maybe a facebook page or a, a song on spotify anything like that um that's coming in then we've got a selection of tips and tricks we're going to be looking at some free vpn services that you can use to protect your privacy how to reduce screen time on a mac and how to cancel app subscriptions on an iphone or ipad and uh it's Halloween this week, so we'll probably talk a little bit about that as well. James, were you have have you been on a podcast while my Samsung tablet's being under repair? I haven't, no. No, no. we haven't been for about a month or so. Yeah. This is the fourth one now in which we've discussed my Samsung <laughs> tablet, my Samsung Galaxy Tab S4. Um, basically a quick recap for James and anyone new to the podcast. Uh, about four weeks ago. Um, half the screen developed a three second delay. That's peculiar. So, isn't it just so you would swipe perhaps through um, a, a website or an article or a document and only the top half of the screen would move to the next page and the bottom half would then wait a bit. It looked a bit like um, perhaps a stable door. Yeah. Um, so I contacted uh, Samsung and they have um, the device is less than 12 months old it's still under warranty and um, they've a uh, contract with a company called we fix here in the uk who do death oh do doorstep repairs and um, what they do they have a cool little van that comes out and they've got a desk and a pc in the back of the van set up for um fixing and uh and diagnostic purposes and they came out had a look at it brought a new screen with them changed the screen still the same um engineer ordered a new motherboard that didn't come the following week when he was supposed to come they sent another screen so it was then rearranged um except the engineer was on holiday so it was then rearranged for last week uh but unfortunately we had hospital appointments with one of the children we couldn't get a different day happy that that particular day and they don't give you a specific time so mm. you can't work around it that way it has to be like they give you the time that they're coming during the day and that's it set in stone so this time uh it's coming tomorrow the engineer is coming tomorrow hopefully with a new main board for my tablet but this has taken ages and i can't fault the engineers because they've been yeah. top quality but the whole thing is yeah i'm not sure it should take a month to get it repaired no especially not if it if you were sending it off somewhere i can understand like the time delay because you know it's got to get there get back and whatever but since it's happening like on your doorstep uh if it does feel like it should be fixed quicker than this. Totally. And in fact, it feels a bit like the easiest option for them would be just to give you a new one rather well, than spending the that. time diagnosing it. Yeah, and there's also the thing I could have sent it away and got it repaired and got it back quicker. This computer that I'm recording this on, this went to Asus for a repair that didn't happen because it turned out there was nothing wrong with it. Um, <laughs> nor their story entirely. Um, and, you know, this came back within a fortnight. Hmm frustrating things isn't it yeah isn't it just isn't it just uh so um let's move on to a very tenuously connected item um <laughs> android tablet um amazon fire sticks run on fire OS, which is based on android the apple tv app is now available in fire tv sticks um which gives you access to your itunes video library and lets you buy new buy or rent new movies and tv shows on itunes are we still calling it itunes for video i think oh God, so i they, think that whole thing's doing my head in yeah it, like, the, the apple podcast is it apple video or is it what is it 
I think it's Apple Video. So iTunes is disappearing, but your content is being migrated to the other services. So there's Apple Video, oh. Apple Podcasts and Apple Music. OK, that more or less makes sense. Yeah. Um, so now, yeah, you can get Apple TV on a Fire Stick. I I find that Fire Sticks tend to get a bit sluggish if you put too much on them. Too many yeah, apps. I've. I've got one, but I only have like five apps on it. I don't really use it for anything. It's just the only reason I actually use it is because it has a remote. I would perfectly <laughs> happily use like my phone, my Chromecast, whatever. But just having the remote is pretty convenient. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah it's so I haven't experienced cool. the slowdown. I um, mostly what we watch on our Fire Stick is um, I was going to say NCIS, but we don't even watch NCIS on the Fire Stick. We watch it on the Prime app on the Xbox. Mm. So mostly we use it <laughs> late at night. Finding a TV show to watch to fall asleep to is my my wife. Yeah. I quite happily go to sleep in complete silence or with a bit of kind of classical music or something, maybe some acoustic blues music, which is something just gentle. But my wife likes a TV show to fall asleep to. So things like Dragon's Den on BBC iPlayer or um, a, an old comedy on the UK TV app. Or her her, rec- her current favourite is episodes of Time Team on YouTube. Oh yeah, that's a good one. It's yeah. sort of like slow TV, isn't it? Yeah, 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 nice. yeah. What do you do at this time of night? Just, we've gone completely off the apple. <laughs> yeah, Let, let's go with this. What do, do you have a TV show to go to sleep to? I don't have a TV show to go to sleep to, but we have not not like a routine, but a bit similar. We have shows that can just kind of go on in the background, yeah. and the BBC has this quiz show called Pointless where you have to get the lowest score to stay in the game. So instead of, you have to correct, guess the correct answer, and the question has also been put to 100 people before the show, and you have to choose the most obscure correct answer in order to get the lowest points. It's a brilliant show. It's a really good format, very fun to watch. Okay. <laughs> I could probably fall asleep to Pointless, to be honest. Um, although... No, let's not go into quiz shows. So the Apple <laughs> TV app on the Fire Stick is um, he's available now. Um, so you just go the normal way of installing an app on the Fire Stick. Go in the search icon and search for Apple TV or look for recommended apps. Um, that will also um, highlight it for you. Uh, we'll move on. We're sticking with... Um, with no, we're not. Um, we're not sticking with anything. Google as launching apps to reduce your smartphone use. So it's the complete opposite of sticking with anything because it's to stop you sticking with things, basically. Yeah. Um, they've launched what's called digital well-being experiments. This is kind of your area of interest, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah. So um, digital well-being has been around for about a year. That's sort of Google's built-in screen time function. So it will disable apps late in the day. It will switch your screen to nighttime, that kind of stuff. And it looks like they've launched experiments are little small features that they may or may not keep um but they're useful things possibly and i guess they're going to see how many people use them whether they put them into the app proper so there's unlock clock which is a live wallpaper that shows you the amount of times you unlock your phone in a day um i'm currently using an iphone but when i was using my pixel i set my own goal to 30 unlocks a day which is quite aggressive but it would be useful to know every time you open the phone rather than having to go into the app to double check that. So that one's cool. Uh, Postbox, which is basically like get your notifications in batches rather than uh, piecemeal throughout the day, which is good because it means you're not constantly checking your phone every time like an email or a text or something comes in. Um, And then the final one is, well, not final. uh, One of the ones is called We Flip, and it's designed to stop you all going on your phones when you're in a group. Now, this is actually something you can do without the phone anyway it's you all put your phones in the middle of the table and turn them upside down and the first person to turn their phone over to have a look at it kind of loses the game and uh, the ways that I've played it before is that you go and buy a round of drinks or you pay for the meal or whatever it is Um, then there's two more there's desert island which makes you choose the apps that are most important to you and once you've chosen them you've got to go full 24 hours using only those apps And then Morph, which I think is actually the most interesting and useful feature, which organizes your apps into home and work modes. And then your phone will adapt depending on what you're doing at that time of day and put different apps at the front of the screen. Now, the reason that I particularly like that one is especially for what myself and Christian do is we're freelancing. So often work and home and relaxing time kind of blur. And if you could have a way that automatically sort of pushes your work apps to the back so you're not constantly checking them when you're not meant to be working 
That'd be awesome. Yeah. I, now I use folders for that, so this that's quite an interesting alternative to the folders. Hmm. Yeah, that's how I've always done it as well, is put like a work folder. But then you, yeah. you kind of feel the temptation to double check it. And I know this for people that work like more traditional office jobs as well, is that they end up with apps like Slack, which you can check from your phone. So yeah. they're only paid for like a nine to five job, but find themselves checking their emails, checking Slack and things because it's easy to access because all you have to do is tap the folder and then go, oh, I'll just see if anyone's, anyone's message. Yeah, yeah. And you find the work drags into your personal life a little bit. Yeah, yeah, not good, not good. So, um, so th- these are five digital well-being experiments um, that you can you can install these now, can't you? I think so. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so check those out now. Um, as with everything that we talk about on the really useful podcast, you will find a detailed list of show notes on make use of, and um, pretty much anywhere you're finding the podcast, uh, you'll find us on. I was going to say iTunes on Apple Podcasts on Spotify, Stitcher, Transistor, and even on YouTube in a strange audio, but no video sort of a way. Uh, so yeah, just check the show notes to find the link to this article. And then uh, the links that you'll require are also in there. Now then, have we reached that point? Ah, the VPN hack thing. So we think that VPNs are safe and secure and and private. And they use encryption. So generally speaking, they are. And of course, there are some VPNs that have less of a good reputation, ones that we wouldn't recommend. NordVPN is a VPN that is quite well known. They advertise on TV. Uh, However, they have recently confirmed that they've had a server breach. And this has caused a bit of consternation and uh, controversy because they've been less than clear over exactly what happened haven't they James? Uh, yeah so they didn't actually tell anyone that the incident took place and it wasn't until I think it was a post on Reddit possibly um, where someone said oh I think this thing happened and then Nord confirmed yes we did have a breach so the breach was back in March 2018 so you know we're looking a year and a half ago yeah now it does make you question if this post hadn't happened would Nord have actually said what happened in public? I I don't know. However, the fact is we do now know about it. Um, And it's been a bit strange. So the the confirmed details are that there was a exploit in the remote management system that a data center left in place in Finland. And Nord didn't know that this system existed and an attacker got in and took keys Now, the keys are able to decrypt traffic, but they change every time that there's a connection made. So anything you looked at in the past isn't encrypted with the same key. So the attacker has very limited amounts of data that they can get to. So in theory, they'd be able to see what you were doing at that very specific point that they injected themselves in. But as soon as you disconnected or reconnected another time, that's it. That that would be their access gone. Yeah. So, of course, it's important, but it's also important to note that that's exactly what your Internet service provider can do anyway. You know, anyone, anytime you connect to the Internet, whoever you're getting the service from can, in theory, see what you're doing, which is why we always recommend to use encrypted VPNs, because then, in theory, no one can see. Now, most people aren't going to be too affected by something like this, because for the majority of browsing, if you're just trying to maintain your privacy, it's like it's an annoyance, but there isn't any clear data that anyone's traffic was actually intercepted anyway. So the thing that's slightly confusing with this NordVPN thing, so that's the details that we already know, but then TorGuard, which is another company, um, has also been thrown into the mix here for less clear reasons. Now, TorGuard was sued by NordVPN in the past, and it alleges that NordVPN tried to blackmail TorGuard by threatening to reveal stolen trade secrets. And then NordVPN orchestrated a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack against TorGuard. And then there are people speculating that this hack of NordVPN was instigated by TorGuard in a sort of tit for tat battle. Right. Um, no one's quite sure whether that really did happen. The thing that it shows is that you should be using a VPN for, to protect your privacy, but they aren't foolproof. And so 
it's just always better to keep that in mind so that when you're browsing, you know that this is a good solution. It's about a bit like having a safe. You know, you can put all your stuff in a safe, but there is always the possibility that someone could, could break into your home and steal the safe. Yeah. So it's just best to keep this in mind that they aren't a full blown privacy protection, foolproof scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really any, add anything to that. The the, the exploit shouldn't have happened. Um, it was apparently a remote management system, some sort of remote software. And I think what needs to be under, underlined here is that it took so long to be divulged and it is important that technology companies and services divulge leaks immediately if only to maintain public trust in them if they're going to go on and hide leaks like this uh, potentially you know in some way yeah if this had been a bigger hack this could have destroyed the entire vpn industry yeah it's completely undermined the entire technology behind vpns and then you know that's the end of it so you know, I, it really puzzles me why the companies aren't clear about this. We've talked about this before on the Really Useful podcast and on Make Use Of in various articles. Uh, that it is important to come clean. Uh, what can you say? Yes, yeah, it's, it's particularly irritating that it's happened with NordVPN because they have been pushing this public image quite a lot. As you said, they advertise on TV. They're very well known. And it makes you worry that a lot of what they're doing might be marketing if they're trying to hide like oh there's this security stuff but you don't need to worry about it you know we'll just we'll just not tell you about that bit but at the same yeah. time we'll continue pushing our service and telling you to download our paid subscription you know it when so much of the industry is based on trust because you don't know for sure how the vpn provider is treating your data you have to choose one that you trust and if nordvpn starts breaking that trust by looking like they're doing lots of adverts but not really taking care of your security then you know it's not a good look for them yeah yeah so that's uh, that's the nordvpn hack and uh, we'll um give you some more details on that in this week's show notes yeah it is a little bit of a read but it's worth it's worth getting getting your head around uh, okay new feature time on the really useful podcast um which is our first new feature since we launched um last year this is um, a little idea I had, basically as an excuse to be able to talk about this thing that I found on the internet. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, hang on, this is this is like we could do this as a feature. Everyone's going to find something new and interesting that they want to share on the internet. Uh, so what happened? Um, shall I go first, or do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. So what happened is I was sat in the car and parked outside a shop. Well, my wife dipped in for some milk and I showed the new Star Wars trailer to my son who was sat in the back of the car. And because I have the car and the phone synced over Bluetooth, you know, it sounds amazing, almost like you're in a cinema um, compared to with, like at home or on a tablet. And then the next track came on and it is it took me by surprise because it was a Fleetwood Mac song and quite a fan of Fleetwood Mac. Um, but it wasn't Fleetwood Mac singing it. It was a young lady called Alex G, who appears to be an independent artist. And she's done a version of Go Your Own Way. And it's really, really good. And that's pretty much my recommendation is to check this out if you like for Fleetwood Mac, or even if you don't. Mm. It's kind of like a, a slowed down um, piano and vocal version of Go Your Own Way. And um, she has a, a full channel. Um, which will be in the show notes rather than the song. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. She's got a superb voice, and uh, I, I don't want to say she's a um, someone to look out for, but she's certainly worth checking out her channel and listening to to her songs because she's really good. Oh, I see that uh, you found that song like just as it launched. Um, so we're recording this yeah. on Tuesday, and it only got uploaded three days ago. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I'll definitely give that a listen afterwards. Yeah, she's really good. Okay, so what have you got? Um, so it's another YouTube recommendation, and this one is Ocean Explorer Gov. It's a YouTube channel run by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. And they have some deep sea diving drones, effectively, that go down and record really cool stuff. And sometimes okay. they do live streams of it as well. And if you've ever seen any photos or videos of deep sea fish 
they are peculiar bizarre things you know with yeah. lights hanging over their head and strange bodies and like it's fascinating stuff and it's all available there for you for free and they have some live cameras that operate you know 24 hours a day um, but sometimes they edit down certain things that they found particular discoveries interesting videos it's it's really fascinating and definitely worth watching it's it's an alien world isn't it under the sea yeah it's one of my favorite areas of ex exploration like i know everyone's really interested in space exploration but for me like the bottom of the sea is absolutely fascinating yeah and it's, it's a it's a crazy place it's um i mean it's kind of alluded to in uh <laughs> popular movie finding nemo isn't it but it's, it doesn't, yeah. it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg of the the deep sea weirdness check that out um is, have you got any favorite video on that channel um there was one that they published the other week which i thought was really fun it was um Oh, here it's called Here Be Monsters, and it's a giant squid filmed in American waters. Like it's only 29 seconds long, but it it, it is really cool looking. How big is it? Um, I don't know. It's quite large. Okay. It's very large. Because I know but, I know rumors of sea monsters are supposed to have been basically squids that didn't die, aren't they? Just kept eating, yeah. and eating, and eating until they become these yeah. huge, humongous ship killing things. And it wouldn't it wouldn't be surprising, you know, like if because we can't it's so dark in some areas of the ocean you yeah. have no idea what's down there no, and there no. could be enormous things that sometimes like just rise up to the the surface level or whatever but it's these videos are fascinating i can't recommend them highly enough cool okay uh i'm a little bit edgy about that now um <laughs> okay let's move on to some tips and tricks um we're back on vpns uh, not all vpns are paid services some are free and there are some that you should not go near because they're basically scams but there are some free vpns that you can use and be reasonably confident that they're secure and that they're private and that your data is not going to get flogged uh so there's um i mean this is the thing with free vpns isn't it there is there is this whole you know, I need a VPN. Do you need, really need a VPN, though, or do you need a proxy? There's that side of it. And yeah. then there's this thing about, I need a free VPN. Are you sure, or do you just need a useful DNS server mm. that will help you stream what you want? Or, I really need a free VPN. Well, if you do need a free VPN, then, you know, it comes with some caveats. Um, I think this is quite a good list that Dan Price at Make Use Of has put together. Uh, I'm going to just quickly run through them. We've got Speedify. There's Cyber Ghost for Chrome, uh, for the Chrome browser. There is VPN Book, Windscribe, Hide.me, Opera VPN, which is a browser-based service uh, for Opera users, and Hotspot Shield. Uh, now, Hotspot Shield and um, Hide, uh, Hide means a proxy service. Hotspot Shield, Windscribe, and Cyber Ghost in particular are quite well-known VPN services. Now, the thing about free VPN is that it's usually a trial and the amount of data you can use is probably quite low as well, which would probably, unless you're needing to browse the web securely and privately, um, most uses for these services would not be what you're looking for. You're probably looking for something that's going to stream video or something that's going to let you torrent securely or whatever. Have you used a free VPN? Um, I haven't, but there was one extra one on Dan's list called uh, Proton VPN, and right. that's brought to you by the same people that did Proton Mail, which is a secure encrypted uh, email service. And I don't use the free version of either service, but I do use the premium version of both services. And uh, Proton VPN, in terms of its quality, its uh, apps, and all the services it offers, is fantastic. And because they operate a freemium model, so basically the premium accounts subsidize the free ones. It is generally considered more privacy focused and it's almost the same features, except you only get limited amounts of servers, but um, you don't have any data caps or anything like that. Okay. So Proton VPN does have 500 servers, but I think you just get a handful with the free account. Okay, that's useful. Um, I, I didn't mention Winscribe, though. I should probably uh, mention that I've recently reviewed Winscribe for the vpn proof website so that's 
link to that will be in the show notes as well. Yes, I have. It was Windscribe. I had to check then. I was thinking, was it Windscribe <laughs> I reviewed? Um, yes, it was. And I was, I was, I was reasonably pleased with Windscribe. So um, yeah, I'll put that link in the show notes too. This is a packed show this week, isn't it? It is, uh, isn't it? Just we're going to move on to ways to restrict content and set limits for kids with screen time on a Mac. Now, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, parental controls for limiting screen time. I just, in fact, this is pretty timely because um, it's not Mac related but it's parental control and screen time related, is that um, my son loves Minecraft, but we've discovered that when it's time to stop playing Minecraft, my son turns into a complete demon. (laughs) And it's just miserable for the next few hours. And it's really, really weird. I remember when I was a kid, you know, 30 odd years ago, playing on Commodore 64 games. And I'd be a bit grumpy for a few minutes after turning off a game, whether I won or not. But it was nothing like this. It's quite a quite a phenomenon. Um, so we've, we've basically come to the decision that the, the game's getting banned for the foreseeable future uh, for both Bruce and his sister, because they're twins. Mm. And you know how how that goes, I don't know. There's plenty of other things that they that they play that they don't get so engrossed in and don't turn so sort of like get grumpy afterwards. And, um, my, my daughter doesn't get quite as grumpy as her brother, but having let one have it, not the other, is just going to cause a load of new problems. Um, and parental controls kind of make that possible because they use Fire tablets, so I can easily just yeah. remotely disable or enable apps, change screen time limits and things. So uh, back to the Mac. Um, it might not be obvious with a desktop operating system, but you can restrict content and set limits for kids with various third-party tools. But macOS comes with a built-in tool called Screen Time, um, which is uh, linked to Apple's family sharing tool. Uh, I I don't have a Mac anymore. I used to have a Mac some years ago, and it kept breaking, mm. which really annoying. Which is kind of given the amount of money that it cost, um, and it, it turned out that it actually had like a built-in issue, um, like a feature. Um, it caused, it <laughs> caused the screen to get going weird, and um, I ended up kind of I didn't know about this until about a month or two months after the mm. uh, care period had run out. So I, I did get a bit cross talking about Max. Um, but basically, there's a family sharing, there's the Apple family sharing, and screen time is linked to it. And you log in with your own Mac credentials, and you open system preferences on your dock select screen time and then you basically use the tool to like switch switch it on set app usage set notifications and and time limits and restrictions and then you, you get a passcode if you need to um, adjust screen time while it's being used by the smaller person uh, you're not really someone who has any use for parental controls are you james i do not have children so no no um however i will say as i alluded to earlier i've just started using an iphone Mm. And I'm also recording at the moment with a Mac and with the Mac OS Catalina update and iOS 13, the screen time now syncs between your devices. So you can keep the same preferences and you can set screen time for your devices Useful. rather than your phone and your laptop. So although I don't use the the parental controls side of things, uh, the screen time usage, I mean, I've only had it for about a week or so. Um, but it's really cool. I like it. And it, it's a good argument for Apple's closed ecosystem. Like if you have yeah. one product, you get another one and they all work together. Like it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was talking, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I, I it's um, something that I'm kind of thinking of at the moment because uh, I did mention the Fire OS tablets that, the, uh, that my twins use, but they are becoming so difficult to support basically with like mm. quirks and things you know tapping books to open and the books not opening and things like that and i'm thinking about moving them to either android or or an uh like a, a, an ipad mini so yeah. so that would be useful as far as my wife's concerned because she has the iphone in the house so mm. she could she could then stay in charge of the parental controls and i can, yeah rather than i you. can do other yeah. things i can work um <laughs> Especially at this time of year when the children are off school. Okay, so yeah, check that out in the show notes. I mean, that is a feature-packed article in itself telling you everything you need Mm. to know about screen time for parental controls on the Mac. And uh, yeah, it's it's really useful to make sure your children are using computers responsibly. 
and other devices too. Uh, now then, speaking of iOS, how do you cancel app subscriptions on your iPhone or iPad? Ben Stegner's uh, a regular on the release for podcast has been looking into it and you start off by finding the subscriptions on your iPhone uh, which is in the uh, settings screen you tap your name and then tap subscriptions and from there you uh, move into the necessary app and if it's a subscription app uh, then you um, tap review the subscription that you've got and then click on cancel subscription it's relatively straightforward have you subscribed to anything yet on your new iPhone then James Fru? Mm, no <laughs> <laughs> i don't really do subscriptions and stuff like no, i had I them know. for a while with google play um but i just found like i never mm. never did anything with that i think this is possibly i mean at the risk of sounding like rah, but uh i think it might be a generational thing i prefer desktops laptops yeah. i'm not so much of a fan of doing stuff on my phone my phone is for when i'm not at the computer rather than my main device so i just don't I don't really subscribe to things on there. Well, do you know, I I am largely the same. Um, I was I was actually in, in another parked car incident recently. <laughs> I installed a music app on my Android phone, and now I ended up. I'll put this in the show notes. Actually, I shared. I basically I did. I, you tweeted it, didn't you? I tweeted it. Yeah. I actually, yes, I saw. Reason, I did a screen recording of it. Um, I think because. I wanted to know if I if I inadvertently created something very cool. Um, I wanted to make sure I had a copy of it, and it turned out that actually the screen recording turned into something else entirely, because the the app um, whose name will come to me in a moment when I actually find it. Um, it wouldn't give me the opportunity to use it without signing up. Mm. with my details it would give me a free trial but i had to give my credit card details yeah and now i've used this it's an app from the same publisher and that has an option to close the screen this mm. app didn't give me the option to close the screen and it i was really really annoyed by it it made yeah, me really, the, really cross understandably because you want to see what the product is like exactly. before you go oh shall i hand over my data shall i create an account or do i pay for it uh, this is, I mean, it's frustrating on apps, but it's a problem that you find all over tech, like particularly because um, I also write for our sister site, Blocks Decoded, which is all about blockchain based stuff. And there's a lot of blockchain based apps, but literally every single one of them requires you to create an account before you can even look at what the interface is like. And I'm quite fickle <laughs> and I look at it and go, well, if you're not going to tell me what you are, like it just has the name on one screen that says sign in. And I'm like, well, honestly, I'm not going to do that. So yeah. I'm just not going to look at your product. And it, it's such a shame because there are probably some really cool things, but I don't have the inclination to sign up to literally every single thing I see on the internet. And uh, they just lose me as a customer. Yeah. The app was GroovePad. And looking at the video, you can see that there is a cross. And you can also see me in the corner tapping the screen. I'm tapping the cross to close the mm. subscription page so I can get on and use the app. And uh, it was it was such a weird experience to like find an app that was doing that. Now it might be that there was a problem with the installation of the app and that portion of the screen stopped working. I doubt it. Cause you know, it's a good phone and it's in good Nick and that's never happened yeah. before. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was, it was very disappointing to come across that. So I think apps that demand you to um, subscribe are probably yeah, I think it probably is a generational thing. I think they're probably, you know, in terms of, you know, for for, for apps to have an industry, for, for the app industry to succeed, there has to be some kind of subscription. But that's not the way to do it. No. What you do is you offer your product, say, this is really cool, show you it, so you can try it and go, oh, actually, I love this thing, and yeah. then pay for it once you're converted. Not try and force you to pay up front, because that makes it sound as if, there's something weird going on with this app that's trying to demand money before even giving me a service. Yeah, yeah. It's a bad look. Mm. You know, back in the day, you used to get um, cover discs, didn't you, on computer magazines and stuff. And you'd get yeah, demo yeah. games, and you'd take the demo games on, you'd put them in your PC, you'd install them, or you'd put them in your, your um, maybe your PlayStation, you'd play the demo games. And then if you liked the demo game, you'd go out and buy the demo game. Yeah, perfect piece of marketing and there's no reason why 
I mean, the model tends to work for a lot of other companies. Stick to the model. It works. It's a successful model that's got 30 years backing it up as a successful yeah. means of uh, shipping software. Crackers. And like even even in different industries, like before streaming, you'd have single releases from an album and to kind of convince you, oh, this is a song that you probably like. You can go out and buy the single or you can go out and buy the album, too. So it was like a teaser for the album. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. It's, I, I still struggle with the idea that people don't actually know about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I used to have like a huge collection of like these tiny little uh, CD cases with just like one or two songs on each disc. It's incredibly wasteful. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there is something that I miss about that. Yeah. 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 I'll say me. I like have holding something. I was I was in a shop the other day and they had a, it was a supermarket where they sell vinyl, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I had to explain to my son what it was, which was just weird. I suppose it, it feels natural, but then, like, even in my lifetime, like, no one was really using records. So, like, I at some point, you're going to have to explain things. And, you know, you got him while he's young. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is strange. And then I was in uh, a bunch of HMV as well. I was looking at record players. And I was thinking, well, if I'm going to buy a record player, I'm probably not going to buy it from HMV. But this is really, really nice. And it sounds amazing. Yeah. Which, so, do you uh, remember which model it was? No, I don't. It was about 150 quid. That's all I can remember. So I'm going to be a little bit uh, self-promotion here. But okay. for make use of, I wrote a buying guide. Uh, which was the best records players you can buy at all budgets. Okay. Uh, but my, it's I think it was a round up of five. But my favourite one is the House of Marley. Can't remember the full name of it, but it's made by House of Marley, which is um, a spin-off company from one of Bob Marley's sons. And okay. I, I've got it. It's it's brilliant, and it's about that kind of price. Right. Okay. Okay. Could have been that. I don't know. Actually, no. I said it was H and V, and I'm thinking it might have been Cruise PC World. I mm. can't remember. Uh which seems to be the general theme of this week's really useful podcast. Let's move <laughs> on, because one thing I can remember is that this week it's Halloween, and you could be listening to this show whilst absolutely petrified by a giant pumpkin outside, or by children knocking on the door wanting sweets. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we've got a couple of uh, Halloween-y things to tell you about. We're going to look at um, some of the best horror movies to watch on Netflix. We're not going to actually look at them um because we've got time <laughs> and some uh some makeup tips as well i don't know why no, this we're is, doing this makeup is, tips. this has become <laughs> a nine hour this is going to be a nine hour podcast we'll do uh live demos of makeup while watching horror films <laughs> oh do you know what? i i'm not a big fan of horror films this entire section fills me with dread now <laughs> oh see I'm, I'm the opposite uh i love this stuff i live for it okay uh, so, do you want to uh, have, have? Do you want to tell us about these horror movies then? Yep. So Netflix is probably a subscription you have, and it although it's not doesn't specialize in horror, it has got some great horror movies on it at the moment. So just in time for Halloween, there is The Conjuring, Insidious, Bird Box, which is a Netflix original, as is Apostle, uh, The Ritual, The Sixth Sense, which is sort of one of the most mainstream popular culture references that people still make reference to nearly 25 years later, the witch green room, Gerald's game and train to Busan. And they're all available on Netflix at the moment. And they're all highly rated and pretty enjoyable horror films. Most of them are more, I'd say thriller psychological horror rather than, you know, gore and, and ghosts and all that sort of stuff. So, um, if you have an aversion, as Christian does, to sort of like horror-related stuff, you might still find some interest in in some of these films. I don't mind some things. I don't mind. Like I'll I'll watch say uh, Alien, which is quite scary, yeah. movie, and as she has horror overtones. And I like sort of like classic horror movies, mm. but I don't really get on with any kind of sort of nineteen ninety onwards horror movie type of yeah. thing. They get they've they're a bit too kind of either gory or too psychological for me. I think. Yeah. Quite a few moved to sort of jump scares as well, where the plot was really thin, but they relied a lot on making things really, really quiet. And then suddenly loud. Yeah. yeah. And using music and the visual cues to scare you rather than the film itself. So yeah. it, was, it was like a film making technique but it's not necessarily anything to do with the film. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's an interesting topic in itself. Um, now, if you are going out on a Halloween, you might be interested in some makeup ideas um, for looking scary, obviously. We can't do the other stuff. Um, now, there's an excellent article by another one of our regulars, Megan Ellis, who's compiled 29 hideously scary Halloween makeup ideas that she's found on the web, which is just mental. I can't even think of three. Just 29. I, can, I should say, I can't even think of 2.9. And she's thought of 29. <laughs> she's found 29. Um, I mean, I've, have you ever been out on Halloween with, with like crazy scary makeup on? Not this kind of level of makeup. Like I've done Halloween you costumes, should. dressing up yeah. and stuff. Um, but the I don't know if you've ever gone on YouTube and looked at makeup tutorials or horror yeah. effects tutorials. Yeah. They are absolutely phenomenal. The skill that some people have is yeah. is incredible. And um, they a lot of people who have this skill put their talents up to as a tutorial on YouTube. And you can look like Pennywise the Clown, um, the White Walkers from Game of Thrones. Cruella de Vil, like there's just some incredibly creative choices out there. I mean, yeah, there's one here much, that's got they, cracked face, a cracked yeah. face, and it looks amazing face, as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bear in mind they do take a lot of time, so you have to be quite committed to doing these. However, if you've got something particularly you want to dress up for, or just want to impress with uh, with your makeup this year and really stand out at the Halloween parties and things. Megan's article is a great place to to start. Yeah, um, but to um, get there quickly because you know it takes a bit of time to look this good. Yeah, which is something I never thought I'd ever f- find myself saying. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, Halloween. Have a great Halloween and uh, do it safely, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, it brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast, in which we've looked at a whole cavalcade of um, news, tips, and tricks and recommendations, which you will find in the show notes and you will find james and myself and, and and gavin and ben and megan and the rest of the team on the release of podcast on apple podcast i think we're also on google podcast i should mention that on on spotify mm. and transistor and stitcher and youtube and pretty much anywhere you find podcasts and you'll find us also at make use of.com let us know what you think by leaving a recommendation so that other people can find us and share us with anyone you think can benefit from what we like to call, I think, a no-nonsense attitude to overcomplicated technology. Our aim is to simplify things so that everyone can, oh my God, I'm going to say it, make use of their tech better. (laughs) Uh, That's it from James and myself. Uh, We'll be back for another really useful podcast next week. Until then, it's goodbye.